Hi there. We're glad you've found us on this video from Advent Lutheran Church in Lake Ann, Michigan. My name's Tim Jan. I'm the pastor of this congregation, and it's my joy to be able to bring to you the preaching text and the sermon for what's going to be the fourth Sunday after Pentecost, which is July 3rd, 2022. Uh, for those watching the USA, we uh, wish you a happy Independence Day. Uh, we would love to have you uh, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can keep getting these videos. We also live stream our worship every Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m. And if you're in the area, we'd love to have, have you come join us in person for worship every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. to be able to hear the gospel and a reminder that Holy Communion is open to all. Let's pray together. O oh God, the Father of our Lord Jesus, you are the city that shelters us, the mother who comforts us. With your spirits, accompany us on our life's journey, that we may spread your peace in all the world. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. This is a reading from Galatians. My friends, if anyone is detected in a transgression, you who have received the Spirit should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if those who are nothing think they are something, they deceive themselves, all must test their own work. Then that work, rather than their neighbor's work, will become a cause for pride. For all must carry their own loads. To those who ta are taught the word must share all in all good things with their teacher. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For you reap whatever you sow. If you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap eternal life from the Spirit. So let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. So then, whatever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, and especially for those of the community of faith. See what large letters I write when I am writing in my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh that try to counsel you to be circumcised, only that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. Even the circumcised do not themselves obey the law, but they want you to be circumcised so they may, be bo they may boast about your flesh. May I never boast of anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is anything, but a new creation is everything. As for those who follow this rule, peace be upon them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. I started this holiday weekend by rereading the Declaration of Independence. It's kind of a worthwhile thing to do now and again. Thomas Jefferson says, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, <clears throat> and women, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. According to the framers of our government, God gives us rights. But then in our text for this Sunday, Jesus says, See, I am sending you out in, like lambs into the midst of wolves. Well, that doesn't sound like the pursuit of happiness. Paul says, Bear one another's burdens and in this way fulfill the law of Christ. Well, that doesn't especially sound like liberty. The Bible doesn't talk about our rights very much, but much more about our obligations to God and to our neighbor. It's always helpful to remember that the Declaration of Independence is a beautiful piece of writing, but it's not the same as the Bible. It's even a theological document, meaning that it does talk about God, but that does not necessarily make it a Christian document. 
on the one hand, our framers say God gives us rights. On the other hand, the Bible says that God gives us duties and responsibilities. And in the middle, we've got Uncle Ben from Spider-Man saying, with great power comes great responsibility, which, if you want to get technical, is also in the Bible. It's Luke 12, 48, to whom much is given, much will be required. But who's counting? I would love someday to host, uh, maybe this will happen in heaven, a 4th of July cookout with maybe Jefferson, Jesus, Paul, and Spider-Man, and just sort all this out someday. Rights and duties don't necessarily have to be in conflict. Our faith and our citizenship doesn't always have to be in conflict, but they do create tension. To be a follower of Jesus and a free society means that we won't make use of every one of our freedoms and that we will always have to be making little choices in our lives. Sometimes we have to choose between exercising all of our rights and doing our duty for God, between happiness and compassion. The word compassion comes from the Latin cum, meaning with, and pasia, which means suffering. To have compassion is to suffer with others. The fact of life that your high school civics teacher may never have told you, but your pastor should have, is if you really want to be happy, care about fewer people. But if you want to care about more people the way that Jesus does, you need to sometimes set aside happiness as a goal. If you just want to pursue happiness, run away from discipleship. Run as fast as you can. Because sometimes sharing each other's burdens, as Christian disciples do, hurts. But for us us who are living in this tension, Paul's words are indeed good news. He says, let us not grow weary of doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. We can live in the tension one day at a time, remembering that God is bringing good out of all that we do, even if we can't see it now. That should help us to not grow weary. One way that God helps us not grow weary is by taking our focus off of self-defense. I read something that made me very weary this week. It said Jesus didn't die for us so that we can continue treating people the way people treated him. Ouch. Sad to say, that's the perception way too many people have of Christians. If the only followers of Jesus that normal people see on a weekly basis are those who are making the headlines, those who have a huge following on social media, those who are making waves and making controversy, then all they have is a stereotype. And the stereotype is we're bigots, that we don't care about others. We only care about securing our own rights. We want to force our beliefs on others. We don't act anything like Jesus. We're hypocrites. And I know those stereotypes are wrong because in my life in the church, I've experienced many people who live like Jesus and love Jesus and love their neighbor. And we have developed all sorts of witty retorts for all those charges. Well, we're not like those loudest, meanest voices. That's not our church. We don't expect people attending to church to be perfect. In fact, we know we're all a little bit messed up. So that may all be true, church. But here's the thing. Paul did not say, let us not grow weary of defending the reputation of Christianity and of Christians, much less of God. Paul said, let us not grow weary of doing what is right. I think what makes us weary in doing what is right is we get distracted and even bored sometimes. We get distracted by the bad behavior of other Christians and it makes us take our eye off the ball. Yes, it does damage our reputation when other Christians engage in controversy and bad behavior. But we won't fix that with words. We will not 
fix that with our words and with our witty retorts and with our defense mechanisms. We will fix it with loving actions by doing what Jesus really did call us to do. The best defense of the reputation of Christians is to continue to do our work without whining about whether, what others are or aren't doing. The second way that God keeps us from growing weary is by reminding us doing what is right does not mean doing everything for everyone all the time. You don't have to raise your hand watching at home, but I'm wondering how many of you are like me and often say to yourselves, well, if I don't see, say yes to this extra thing, then no one else will. And you end up saying yes to way too much stuff. Does that sound familiar? The whole bear one another's burdens thing can feel like a pretty heavy burden if you feel like you're carrying everyone else's stuff all at once. So God's word to us in this text is, firstly, you're not. It may feel like you're carrying everyone else's burdens, but you're not. That's impossible. Secondly, even if you could, you wouldn't have to. That's not what following Jesus is. Following Jesus isn't taking everybody else's burdens onto yourself and letting everybody else be scot-free. The world has only one Savior. His name is Jesus Christ. You're not the Savior. You may have noticed what seems like a contradiction here in this text I read for you because Paul says, bear one another's burdens, but later he writes, each must carry their own load. It's actually not a contradiction. You just have to read close. You see, the work is to carry others' burdens. To focus not on our own interests, but on helping others. And if ever everybody does that, the burden would be quite light. Now, the test of the work, whether we feel like we are doing everything we should, is on each of us as an individual. The testing and the figuring out, am I doing what I can, that is is the load that everybody must carry on their own. It's hard enough for me to live in the tension and to try and do my best and help others with their burdens without also judging you on how well you're doing it. That's between you and God. Finally, God keeps us from growing weary by taking our focus off of numerical success. There's lots of ways to measure success as a follower of Jesus, but not all of them can be measured. Yes, all of us are concerned after the pounding every congregation, every Christian congregation, every congregation of every faith really has gotten from COVID-19. Yes, it would be awesome to see more smiling faces in the, in the seats every Sunday and to be able to have enough financial resources, not just to hang in there, but to grow and to further our mission of connecting through Christ. It would be awesome to see numbers going up of families being helped by our baby pantry and youth being affected by our Sunday school and dollars raised for worthy causes. It all feels awesome when those numbers do go up and it can make us weary when they go down, even if we know it's happening all across the country. God's word reminds us today, we are not called to obsess about the numbers. We are called to do what's right. Just as Jesus told his disciples ahead of time when he sent them out as a 70 apostles, he said, some villages will welcome you, others won't. That's not on you, that's on them. Don't focus on that. Focus on your job. Just keep showing people by your actions that God is near. Keep healing people. Keep doing justice. Keep bearing people's burdens as best you can. The harvest will come in God's time, not in ours. It's hard to have faith in that in our world today. It's hard to have faith that the harvest will really come. 
depending on the day, for me, it's not hard to believe there's a God. There is or there isn't, and certainly our minds seem attuned to that transcendent frequency, the idea that there must be something beyond ourselves that we long for. Depending on the day, it may not even be hard to believe in miracles. Stuff that we can't explain happens all the time. But to really trust in the midst of this world's suffering, in the midst of this world's ugliness, that no act of love is ever wasted, that takes faith. To know that nobody would blame us for living the American dream and just pursuing our own happiness, and yet to still believe at the end of the day that it's worth it to carry one another's burdens, that takes faith. To have no idea how our lives will turn out, when we'll reach to the end of our road, and yet to follow Jesus anyway, believing that we won't be looking back with any regret or resentment, but rather with deep gratefulness for all that we've seen in Christ. That takes faith. Thankfully, we know that God is pretty generous generous in giving us that faith because, well, here we are, and we're not weary yet. Amen.